Uh, in 2002, the legislature created a new tax on unemployment insurance, and it raised taxes on uh, small businesses and lower taxes on big businesses. And significantly, that bill did not have an emergency clause on it. And so citizens filed an initiative, uh, a referendum, Referendum 53, got enough signatures, the voters vetoed the tax, and the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that uh, uh, that, that repeal was okay. And it was really a perfect example of the referendum power in action, the power uh, that the people had. The people exercised their rights and they won. But what ended up happening is the legislature didn't like the outcome of that, not one bit. So they set out to essentially repeal that referendum power. And frankly, they've succeeded. R53 in 2002 was the last referendum on taxes. Since then, for 15 years, the legislature has raised numerous taxes, and not once was there ever a referendum like R53 to give the voters the chance to vote on it. And how did the legislature do that? R53 taught them a lesson. Slap an emergency clause on a tax bill, and you'll make it referendum-proof, blocking any and all repeats of R53. So when the legislature raised taxes in 2003, the bill included an emergency clause. When they raised the gas tax and imposed a new estate tax in 2005, they slapped an emergency clause on the bill and precluded the people from doing a referendum. Even though the voters had a constitutional right to referendum, the legislature had found a way to take it away. And that, Your Honor, is a tragedy, a real gross injustice. So in 2007, when I drafted Initiative 960, I included a new policy called a tax advisory vote that responded to the legislature's essential repeal of referendums. An advisory vote doesn't allow the public to, vote, to veto a tax increase the way a referendum does, but an advisory vote at least puts each blocked tax increase on the ballot for the voters to vote on. When drafting that section on advisory votes, I had in mind R53 and the tax bills in 2003 and 2005. And I was very specific. When the legislature raises taxes and blocks the people from voting on it, the voters get an advisory vote. And if the bill contains multiple revenue sources, there must be a separate vote on each one. In the intent section, I made it clear that voters wanted the chance to vote on each tax increase individually. And if a tax bill raises taxes on some people and lowers them on other people, like R53 did, the people get to vote on the tax increase portion of the bill. Now this law that voters approved was written by me so it could be understood by regular voters. When considering legislative intent for a ballot initiative, you consider how the legislation was understood by an average voter. The Attorney General is construing the language as a lawyer would interpreting a legislative bill. How would a lay person oh. define a revenue source? Uh, yeah, that really comes, that's the gist of this case it seems, that yes. revenue source is the determining term for how many advisory votes are required. It's not defined in the initiative. Mm -hmm. um, a revenue source, one might imagine, could be as broad as what the Attorney General's office has articulated, mm -hmm. one of the different titles within the RCW. Um, a revenue source could be an individual taxpayer. I am a source of taxes to the state, and we don't want a different advisory vote for mm -hmm. each person paying the taxes. Um, isn't that inherently ambiguous? I mean, there's some things we can look to, but if you just look at those two words, revenue source, is that an ambiguous term in context here? Well, I think you need to look at it as a difference between if this was a legislative bill passed by legislators, you might be able to argue, well, of course, a proper interpretation. Legislators must have had it in their heads, Title 82 and Title 83 versus Title 84. But this is an average voter determining whether or not they wanted to uh, understand this bill. And it was a citizen initiative. It was written by a regular voter, and it was passed by regular voters three times. And I would ask, who would you believe when it comes to what it says and what was intended? The person who wrote it and voted for it and supported it, or the attorney general who didn't write it? Your Honor, I would ask you to pretend that it's 2007 and you're a regular, normal person. I actually want to come back to that. Okay, go ahead. It's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. You wrote this. Mm -hmm. You're arguing there's a certain amount of intuitive appeal that you 
should have some deference given to you about what this means, but is there any authority out there in the case law or elsewhere mm -hmm. that indicates that the person who authored an initiative is given some deference in his or her construction of the initiative? Uh, no, I'm not implying that at all. I'm saying I'm one of the people that voted for it, but the people who actually voted for the initiative were not the Attorney General. They are not people, and I would think that this is, is somewhat intuitive, would not know Title 82 from Title 83 or 84. These are regular voters that are looking at the language of the initiative, and I'm asking you to kind of visualize yourself in, in 2007 reading Initiative 960, and when you came to the section on advisory votes, you read that when the legislature raises taxes and they block it from a referendum with an emergency clause, there's going to be a tax advisory vote, and if there's more than one revenue source in it, you get to vote on each one. Now, I'm just asking you to apply that same logic, that same understanding of that law to this bill that was passed by this legislative session. The question is, would the average voter agree that this bill contains three tax increases deserving three votes, or would the average voter agree with the Attorney General that all three tax increases are the same because they're all uh, excise taxes and they're all in Title 82? I'm just asking the court to read these statutes through the eyes of an average, regular, normal voter and allow the voters to vote on each tax increase in the bill. The uh, tax increase on bottled water, the tax increase on fuels tax, and the tax on internet sales. Um, and I tried as best I could to try and address these issues. In the briefs, you said you read tax on, on internet sales or is it different enforcement mechanisms? It is a tax increase under the statute that was uh, drafted that defines what is a tax increase. It's any action by the legislature that results in an increase in state revenue. And under the statute that was, that was drafted, it makes it very clear that anything the legislature does that results in additional revenue flowing into the state coffers, that is, constitutes a tax increase. This is a very, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. So even though the rate didn't increase, the legislative direction about collecting those results in more tax revenue coming in and therefore, in your um, estimation, it is a tax increase under that definition. Absolutely, and that's probably the most striking thing that I saw in the Attorney General's brief that frankly surprised me when I, when I entered into this. They claim that the tax increases in the bill really aren't tax increases at all. And I think that it's really important to look at the statutory language because it is very exact and very specific that when it comes to what is a tax increase, it's any action by the legislature that results in additional uh, state tax revenue. They've already acknowledged, or I should say, they've already calculated this thing's gonna cost and, and bring in $565 million over the next 10 years. If not for the action of this bill, that money would be in taxpayers' pockets, it wouldn't be in the government's coffers. So by the very definition of the law, as long as they calculate that it brings in additional revenue, it is by definition a tax increase. This is a strict definition that I know a lot of legislators didn't really care for, and the stakes for what is a tax increase used to be much higher. In the uh, earlier days, it was a difference between whether it required a two-thirds vote of the legislature to pass or a simple majority to pass. The stakes were dramatically higher. The stakes here are very uh, minor in comparison. If it's a tax increase, we all get a chance to at least express an opinion on it at the ballot box. It's not a huge burden on the government for them to be able to do this where when it, the two-thirds requirement was, was in place and the lieutenant governor, as I tried to outline in my uh, strict reply, he was making a determination and construing the law knowing that it was the difference between it requiring a two-thirds requirement and a simple majority. And all I'm uh, looking at in, and, and evaluating and asking of this court is that requiring the Attorney General to follow the law as written is not costly, it's not burdensome, and it's not inconvenient to the government. Uh, what they've essentially done is they've repealed the right to referendum. It's completely gone. And I'm just saying, can't the system allow the people this modest response? This, this tiny victory, the chance to express an opinion at the ballot box on each tax increase, the opportunity to learn which tax increases were increased and how much those tax increases are gonna cost, and can't we just get a law that we passed three times implemented the way an average voter would assume that it would be uh, interpreted? 
these tax advisory votes haven't been around a long time. Um, so at this early stage in their history, I think it's really important for the court to direct the attorney general to follow the law as it's written and, and not allow this interpretation, and I would argue misinterpretation, to water down what is left of what the voters ended up voting for. So there's, the attorney general's office has cited um, a line of cases indicating that when a statute is ambiguous, the agency that is entrusted with the administration or enforcement of that statute is given some deference as to its construction of that ambiguous statute. Um, do you disagree with that assertion in this context? I understand that when it comes to interpreting laws, um, lawyers make it more complicated sometimes than it really is. I don't argue that these, this is ambiguous in any way, shape, or form to that average voter. They understood exactly what they were voting for. I would say that it is not ambiguous that a tax increase, which is defined as any action by the legislature that results in additional revenue, I don't know how you can find that ambiguous. If more money is brought in as a result of a governmental action, in this case, passing a law that includes additional requirements for the government to be able to collect more money, if they're taking money that otherwise would be in the taxpayer's pockets and giving it to the government, under the strict definition of what is a tax increase under this law is not ambiguous. And the idea of a revenue source being ambiguous I would argue that that is not ambiguous at all. The legislature differentiated in the bill three individual tax increases. The fiscal note differentiated three individual tax increases in the bill. And, the, and as I point out in one of my briefs, the, the governor himself had the opportunity to line item veto any one of these individual tax increases. He looked at each individual one and accepted each one, but he could have rejected some of them as well. And all we're asking for and all the, the intent behind this advisory vote was is the people should have the same rights as the governor did to evaluate each of them individually for each one to stand on its own merits and for the people to be able to just express themselves. Bottled water, didn't really like that one. Internet sales, I didn't really care about that one. That one didn't bother me. This one over here on self-produced fuels, I believe that that one was absolutely fine with me but they ought to know how much they each of these individual ones cost. And I think that that's another dangerous aspect of this bill, or this interpretation that the Attorney General does, is it slaps them all together and says, this is $565 million over the next 10 years. And you don't know how much of that was the bottled water, how much was the internet sales collection, how much was the self-produced fuels. And one of the big intents of the measure uh, put in op-eds throughout the campaign, etc., was this idea, it's a tax increase report card. It's a chance for you to learn how much your taxes were raised and how much each one is going to cost you over a period of time. I would argue and, 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 and request of the court that this is very clear. It shouldn't take a new initiative redefining terms that are commonly understood, and if the legislature uh, uh, deems fit, they can modify any of these statutes, but they haven't done so in the last 10 years. So I would argue that anybody that uh, doesn't want to follow these laws can lobby the legislature to change them. But until they're actually changed, that we should actually abide by the laws as they're written. And I would argue these are not ambiguous. These are very straightforward things. But if you do think there is some ambiguity, I would ask you to look through the eyes of an average voter and not necessarily uh, an attorney general that's used to analyzing legislative bills by legislators. They have a different mindset. I can actually agree that a legislator would know the difference between Title 82 and, and differentiate between it and 83 and 84. But an average voter is not even going to know that these things are separated into titles. They would just look at it as, my tax on bottled water is a different tax than what you're going to charge me uh, for buying something over the internet. And self-produced fuels is clearly a different tax increase, different set of taxpayers affected by it than the people over here. Uh, I would just close with this, is that these really do have an impact on uh, candidate campaigns, which I think is, is significant, is that the Secretary of State breaks down by legislative district how the votes are on these advisory votes. So you are able to tell what level of support is in each district for the bottled water tax for various 
individual taxes that are in the bill. And that differentiation, I think, provides a dramatically more uh, nuanced understanding of the voters in each district so that legislators, when they see these votes and see these results, will say, I'm going to calibrate maybe in the future how I treat these tax issues in the future if they know how voters feel about each individual tax. If it's all clumped together, the only thing you're going to know is there's maybe a vague general opposition to this undefined clump of taxes, where if they're individualized, I think that you get a much broader, much better view. And that was certainly my intent. I'm not saying that I'm king and everyone should follow what I say, but I think that the intent of the initiative was clear and the average voter looking at this law, excuse me, uh, looking at this law would understand a separate revenue source as looking at EHB 2163 and seeing that they differentiated three taxes in the bill, it's pretty clear to me that those are three revenue sources that the government's planning on taking. Thank you. Final question for you Please. before I hear from Ms. Castillo. Um, there, and I'll come back to this after I talk to Ms. Castillo for your rebuttal. But there's some argument threshold issue in this case about whether or not I should even reach the underlying merits. Mm. Um, I'll have more questions for you after I talk to the state. But the first question I have is why didn't you file something earlier? I know this is all incredibly fast turnaround in these kinds of cases. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these state-oriented cases have very short turnarounds and with the risk of losing a right to appeal actions if not done quicker. The state indicates that perhaps you should have filed um, a motion for an injunction in an action to prevent different things from happening along the way. Why did you initiate this action on August 4th rather than, let's say, July 27th or 8th? Um, I asked the Attorney General specifically, please notify me as soon as the short descriptions come out. As soon as those short descriptions ca came out, I immediately, within an hour, told them, this doesn't seem right. This is three tax increases. You really ought to do it this other way. And, and they said, we respectfully disagree. They were very respectful about it. We respectfully disagree, but that's not how we interpret the law. At that point, I was struck with, OK, this isn't right. This is, uh, this is an injustice. You know, let me see if I can find a lawyer that's willing to take on the case and do it without getting paid. It's kind of hard. And at the end of it, after that process of, of attempting all those things, I said to myself, I'm not a lawyer, but I just think this is wrong what they're doing, and I'm going to do it myself. Not, never done one before. It took me a little bit of time to figure out actually how to file the paperwork. And, and I would argue, again, I'm not challenging the short description that they wrote. I'm challenging the construction of a statute that, was, what, that is the law. And the way they're reading this law and construing it and evaluating it is what I'm challenging. So yeah. was the oh, action sorry. the Attorney General's office sending the letter to the Secretary of State, or was the action the Secretary of State subsequently assigning only one number to this engrossed bill? Uh, when, they when they specifically sent the letter, they said there's these three bills that we've identified have tax increases in them. And there was no indication at that point that there was only going to be one vote on it. I thought that it was possible that they were going to have multiple votes. Once, once they actually did the short descriptions, I was able to learn that the short description that they wrote gave no indication of the, uh, uh, I apologize, uh, of how they were going to articulate it. And it was when I received that, that that I felt the need to write that second declaration, which, differ, which, which highlighted a fact that because of their misconstruing the bill, for the first time we're going to have an advisory vote where we're not even going to know who's actually going to end up paying the taxes. So, I mean, all I can say is I did the best I could, I moved as quickly as I could, and I would think it would be unfortunate uh, because this is going to be a recurring thing, uh, that this isn't moot, that, that advisory votes will continue in the future, and I'm just extremely concerned, especially in their, their reply, that they're arguing that these aren't even tax increases, and if they're not even tax increases under that interpretation, uh, uh, I think that's really dangerous moving forward. So I appreciate you giving me a chance to uh, address that uh, question of was it, whether or not I was timely. I moved as quick as I could, and I would think it would be really unfortunate that they would somehow um, avoid judicial review because 
I didn't do it in two days, I did it in five days. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Thank you very much. Ms. Castillo. <coughs> And if you could begin your argument after making your introduction to by identifying what the Attorney General's office believes Mr. Iman should have done to preserve this issue and get it before a court for judicial review. Thank you, Your Honor. Again, my name is Callie Castillo for the record. I'm a Deputy Solicitor General with the Attorney General's office. Mr. Iman cannot receive the relief he is seeking today. The issue is, is that the advisory vote designation for number 17, which is for EHB 2163, became final on the day that the Attorney General established this short description. Mr. Iman did not appeal that within the time period before it became final, and therefore this case is moot. Mr. Iman's action conflates his arguments about the construction of the advisory vote statutes with the relief he's seeking. And the relief he is seeking is to undo advisory vote number 17. However, by statute, that is not appealable, and therefore this matter cannot proceed. And are there really two separate issues here, though? There's a short description, but there was an initial action that said there's only going to be this number of items on the ballot. I mean, couldn't he be arguably appealing the designation of the number of advisory votes rather than the short description language itself. Yes, and that's exactly what he should have done. There is a very short time period that the statutes give in which there is the statute, the Attorney General by August 1st must designate which statutes are going to be designated for advisory votes. There are five days for the Secretary of State to then issue the relevant numbers and then an additional five days for the Attorney General to then come forward with the short description. So at what point in that process was he supposed to do what? At any point in time after July 27th when the Attorney General issued its notice to the Secretary of State that it was going to be doing three advisory votes for this year. So you agree that that letter on July 27th from the AG's office is the one that set the number at three? Yes, okay. absolutely. And then by the time that the Attorney General issued its advisory vote short descriptions on August 3rd, that by statute is no longer appealable. And you know, Mr. Eyman says that you know, he is the author of this and therefore he knows the statute. Well, he also put in the initiative, Initiative 960, that the short descriptions are not appealable. So Mr. Eyman is mixing up what he can do here. He is not simply arguing about the construction of these statutes. He's talking about a specific designation and the advisory vote number 17 and the language within that. So he missed this by a day then? Is that the argument? No, he actually missed it between that window between July 27th and August 2nd. August 2nd? Yes, because August 3rd is when the advisory vote number 17 as well as the other two advisory votes short description language became final. And so in hearing the reason why he waited, on the 27th he received notification in essence that it wasn't the same number of advisory votes he thought there should be. He scrambles to find someone. What should have been at the most, possibly up to 10 days, was truncated because the Secretary of State's office moved so rapidly. It was the same day. So, and then it was less than five days, if you don't count the day the initial action was taken, before the short, um, the, the language was finalized. And so, whereas he, as of the 27th, he may have thought he could have had 10 days, he ended up having far fewer than 10 days. Yes, and that is the nature of these statutes. These, um, so is it possible that this all could have happened in a single day and he would have been shut out? It's, I guess conceivably it is possible, but I think there, there are some different um, actions that could have been addressed should it occur at all and within a 24 hour period of time. But the point is, is that this is moot. The, he had plenty of time between the uh, July 27th and the August 2nd to take some sort of emergency action to have the Attorney General redesignate the statutes. And so, and so that's the timing issue. Um, there's also an argument that this isn't a proper action under the Uniform Declaratory Judgment Act. Um, 
what if this isn't a declaratory judgment action, what type of action should this have been a mandamus action, something different? I think it should have been a mandamus action, but it should also, within that five um, day period of time, it's the problem is, is the relief that Mr. Iman is seeking. Because he's not talking about the construction of the statute going forward and having this court declare what these laws mean. Instead, what he's seeking to do is he's, he's seeking to undo the Attorney General's application of those statutes to advisory vote number 17. So if he does this as a mandamus action, would that have satisfied that issue? I understand there's still a timing issue. It could conceivably. I'd like, I mean, obviously, being an attorney, I'd like to go through all of the different pieces, but I could see that. I could also see a, a TRO, as we suggested in our briefing. There are a number of different ways that this could have proceeded. And unfortunately, he just erred in its procedure of doing this. And so also, I mean, if this had been a mandamus action, he would have been, the caption of this action would have been the same. He would have been suing um, Robert Ferguson as attorney general. It's really just the verbiage that would have been different, and he is a pro se. And so there is some leeway. I recognize there's other issues here, but I want to make sure I hone in on each issue couldn't the court conceive of this as a mandamus action in essence, given that this is a pro se litigant? Yes, Your Honor, the, the court could and you know should give pro ses. They are, they are to follow the law, but there should also be some leeway in it. But even then, Mr. Eyman cannot get around the fact that the relief that he's seeking is to undo advisory vote number 17. And by statute, that is not appealable. And therefore, that anything having to do with engrossed House Bill 2163 and the designation of advisory vote number 17 is moot because that designation is not appealable. But even turning to the merits, the Attorney General's construction of the advisory vote statutes to this particular House Bill is reasonable. You agree it's ambiguous, right? I mean, there's no claim by the Attorney General's office that this is unambiguous language. Absolutely, it is absolutely ambiguous. And that highlights the absurdity of the various different constructions of that term. <coughs> because under Mr. Iman's interpretation of revenue source, anything that increases taxes on any individual within the state could conceivably be designated for an advisory vote. Taking that to the absolute absurdity, it could mean even if the legislature decides that they're going to pay for additional auditors within the Department of Revenue, such that collection of particular taxes may increase, that would, under Mr. Iman's definition, be designated for an advisory vote. But that is not what the people meant. The Attorney General's office has construed the advisory votes and revenue source to match not only what it is in law as to what type of taxes there are, excise, property, um, or estate taxes, but is also in line with what the people intended with Initiative 960. And if you look to the people's intent statement of Initiative 960 and then compare it to the exhibits that we attached to specifically um, Exhibit A, if you want to pull it up, you can see with me that it meets each and every one of those contents. First of all, it matches the legislative action taken based on the type of tax, excise tax. But there's a recognition that if a single action had hit upon multiple types, that would still need to be split upon into two different advisory boards. Yes, and that's a, because that's a reasonable construction in line of, of recognizing that should the legislature ever in one action both raise property taxes and raise an excise tax, that that would need to be split apart. But it doesn't make sense to split apart within the single legislative action all types of excise tax. And if you look at example um, A, Exhibit A, designation for advisory vote number eight, that will show why that makes sense. There, the legislature simply eliminated tax preferences for the marijuana industry. That necessarily impacted the no tax, excise tax, I mean, I'm sorry, the retail sales tax, the litter tax, and others. 
it does not make sense that within one legislative bill for then you to have four different advisory votes because they all impact those various kinds of taxes. The Attorney General's reading of revenue source makes sense within both the law as well as what the people want because it also shows the people exactly what the legislature voted on. It is that designation. And if you compare it to Exhibit D, which is the final votes cast by the legislature, the people see exactly what each individual legislature <coughs> voted on that particular bill and whether they voted yay or nay on it. It would not make sense to then triple or quadruple each and every one of these statements by, by advisory vote because it would be duplicative. So the people see what the legislature voted on, and the legislators get to see what the people then say about their particular votes. Let me rewind this for a second, but realize I forgot a question. I understand that the relief that Mr. Hyman is seeking is arguably unavailable given the finality of the, the language. Is it logistically and literally available such that the Secretary of State, if I were to rule that Mr. Iman is correct, could implement an order requiring three advisory votes? Yes, the uh, voters' pamphlets go into effect on September 1st, and so we have um, contacted the Secretary of State's office. If that were to be undone, it is physically possible to change everything. Thank you. Thank you. So it, again, it doesn't make sense for the way that Mr. Iman is construing this to meet both how the law works as well as what the people wanted for the advisory vote. And how the current system works in each one of the examples meets each one of those factors of showing the voters what was voted on by the legislatures, what type of tax it is, the excise tax versus the property tax. And then also, because of the 10-year cost production, breaks it down into the different subcategories in which the voters can see the retail sales tax is going to increase, the b &O tax is going to increase, or the litter tax is going to increase. All of the pieces are available within the Attorney General's construction of these statutes to give the voters what they asked for in Initiative 960. But even setting all of that construction aside, Mr. Iman is simply incorrect about what he is saying in engrossed House Bill 2163 deaths. The retail sales tax is due on items purchased. And if you do not pay a retail sales tax, every individual who purchases an item owes a use tax. So even though the law before engrossed House Bill 2163 um, that those taxes were still owed on internet sales. But what Engross House Bill 2163 did is it then put on the retailers a mandatory duty to either collect that tax or give the purchasers, the, the buyers, notice that that tax is due and therefore they're paying it. It is simply increasing the enforcement mechanism for the state to collect on these taxes. Now, there is a separate tax increase in that portion of the bill relating to the B&O tax for on nexus. What the, what the legislature did is it expanded the definition of nexus. In other words, who has connection to this state in having some sort of seller activity or, or other activity such that the law can reach out and mandate that they pay the business and occupation tax. The Attorney General's Office does agree that, that that portion is increased along with the other retail sales tax at issue in this case. And so that is why the designation has the retail sales tax, the b &O tax increase, as well as the use tax increase. All of that is reflected in the designation for advisor vote number 17 and will be reflected in the 10-year cost production. For all of these reasons, Mr. Iman simply cannot obtain the relief that he's seeking today, both because of the procedural issues as well as the substance of the challenge that he is making. If this court has no further questions, I will turn to Mr. Iman. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Mr. Iman, your case, you get the final word. Um, what I'm also particularly interested in at this point is the argument that 
as this process moved along, we ended up getting the short description that under initiative 960 is not subject to appeal. Um, why does that the buck not stop there two days before you file your action? Very good. Um, I'm ADHD, probably pretty heavy on the H, so there's like 15 things I want to say simultaneously, so I'll, I'll have to prioritize here. Um, I think the biggest thing I would emphasize is uh, for five years of advisory votes, the Attorney General's office followed the law. They did it as it was intended. Uh, there's nothing wrong with if there's multiple taxes on marijuana that, to put those together. That's totally consistent, totally fine. What would have happened if I hadn't been bird dogging them this year, not anticipating that it was they weren't going to apply the law correctly. This stuff isn't published in the newspapers, the fact that they just notified the Secretary of State. I happen to be bird dogging them because I like to stay abreast of what they're doing. And I was frankly surprised that they went with this approach. So I moved as quickly as I could. Um, a mandamus action is a, an action that in my uh, judicial experience has always been unsuccessful. Whenever there were lawsuits against the two-thirds requirement, for example, they said, well, we're seeking mandamus to order the lieutenant governor to take certain action. And the court said, we're not going to interfere and order a state official to take certain actions. I'm not going to do that. So everybody I talked to said, you're seeking declaratory judgment, which is exactly the approach that our opponents took with the two-thirds requirement. That's when they got the court's attention is saying, we're asking you to declare something a construction of a law, a law that exists, and we're asking you, the court, to basically look at the same law that the Attorney General did, and, 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 and I'm used to de novo uh, interpret, uh, analyses, because that's what ballot titles are, is that you, with fresh eyes, will look at this law and not give deference to the Attorney General, that uh, you would look at it and, and see whether or not, in your judgment, this makes sense. And the aspect that I wanted to highlight, and I included it in my brief, was a quote from Lieutenant Governor Brad Owen in, when he was interpreting this law back when it was a question of what is a tax increase when he was analyzing bill in 2009. And he said, 960 was drafted with very strict parameters and the president, like the members of this August body, is charged with enforcing its, uh, its strictures. It may be that the strict language of 960 results in harsh and undesirable consequences, but this is a result of the strict language of the initiative, not the judgment of the president. He looked at this exact same law that, that the Attorney General is looking at, and he agreed that because there was a bill that increased revenue, it was by definition a tax increase. Probably wasn't the definition he would have written, probably wouldn't be the definition that the legislature would draft but it is the law that was written and that the voters voted for. And in that law, it says there will be an advisory vote if there is a tax increase as defined by RCW 43-135-034. And that specific definition says any action by the legislature that results in additional state tax revenue is by definition a tax increase. In this bill, there are three distinct tax increases. Three, I'm sorry, I was, oh, no, no, no. oh I, I apologize. I was just sitting in my seat. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, nerve wracking experience, I uh, may never do this again, but it's uh, interesting. Uh, so I think it's really, really important to, to look at the bill and the strict language of the law, and the law said, if they take an action that raises taxes, there's gonna be an advisory vote. If there's more than one revenue source in it, I'm willing to, uh, to, to concede that the definition of revenue source uh, could be interpreted to be the retail sales tax, the B&O tax, and those kind of separations. That's maybe how a legislature could look at it. But the way the bill put it, the way the fiscal note put it, the way the, the, the governor looked at it, is these are three distinct tax increases on bottled water, fuels, and internet sales. There are three distinct tax increases as defined by the bill, the fiscal impact statement, and, and the uh, judgment of the governor. And all we're asking the court to do is that that is a reasonable interpretation. Frankly, I think it's a more reasonable interpretation of what an average voter would think. And I'm not disagreeing that the attorney general is uh, when they say this is a reasonable interpretation. I just don't think that it's reasonable given the 
preponderance of the law and the language in the initiative and hopefully uh, the briefs that I filed, that there's simply no additional burden on the state to interpret it this way, which is the way the bill did it, the way the fiscal note did it, and the way the attorney uh, and the way the, uh, the governor interpreted it. Um, all it would do is just repeat what's already in the brief, and you say you already read that. I really want to emphasize this last part, is that I challenged the law before I even saw the short description. I'm not challenging the short description. It's their interpretation that this bill involves one tax increase. And they were talking about absurd results. What I find absurd is that they say all excise taxes in Title 82 are all the same. So what's the time limitation for you to challenge the designation in terms of the number of advisory votes? If, if this isn't a process that moves along, mm -hmm. with this final step being the short description that's not subject to appeal, um, if that time frame passes, at what point is it too late for you to seek get the relief you're seeking? You know, obviously the law is whatever the courts believe is reasonable. And it seems to me that it is reasonable that we moved in a, I, I moved in a timely manner, that I did everything I could. I was proactive. I sought to try and resolve it without litigation. And, and as I said, I challenged the law before I even saw the short description. The short description, frankly, bolstered my argument that, that this interpretation is resulting in an absurd result. For the first time in 15 advisory votes, it's the first time voters aren't going to be told what's actually going to be taxed. Uh, the lawsuit was filed um, uh, after I was notified that there were going to be three, uh, that there was only going to be one vote on the on that particular bill and once I looked at the bill I saw that it differentiated three different tax increases so uh, uh, I just don't think that the rules of legislative construction allow for this kind of kind of out of the corral uh, action by the Attorney General but uh, uh, I do appreciate your giving this your consideration and f oh it sounds like you have a question I do have a question for you. Um, so you indicate this was not filed and served um, you had not yet seen the short descriptions when you filed them, sir, but they were finalized and filed with the Secretary of State's office the day before you filed and served this. Is that right? Uh, it says the I, Attorney General then filed the advisory vote short descriptions on August 3rd. Uh, um, I mean, I was literally in your courtroom asking for a date, and it was at that, that hearing that I asked Rebecca Glasgow, would you please send me the short descriptions? Are they out yet? I didn't even know that they were even, uh, and she sent them to me that afternoon. Okay. Anything else? No. no. Thank, thank you, you very much, sir. sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Iman. I am prepared to rule at this time. Before I do so, I want to commend both parties for the quality of briefing and argument in this case. Um, it's a very interesting and important issue. I appreciate when I have everything I need at my disposal based on what the parties have filed with the court. Um, I also looked at the references cited in the papers filed, but the quality was high, it was clear, and I appreciate that very much. Um, this case begins with a threshold issue that is in essence two threshold issues. One is the nature and form of the action and whether or not it is satisfactory to obtain judicial review, um, seeking the relief that Mr. Iman seeks. The second is the timing. As to the first, um, whether or not this type of action and this type of relief is appropriate for a Uniform Declaratory Judgment Act action, um, I find that this, the manner in which this action was initiated was sufficient to bring these issues before the court. Whether, I do not need to find whether or not this needed to be a Uniform Declaratory Judgment Act action, or whether it should be construed as a writ of mandamus. Given the fact that the identity of parties involved are sufficient for either one, given that the action was against um, Attorney General Ferguson, and given that the relief is that was requested was the relief that would be needed in this case, um, particularly given that we have a petitioner who is pro se and the liberal rules that are applied in that context. I do not find that the nature of this action is a bar to this court reaching the underlying issue. That leaves the second threshold issue, however, and I do find that that is dispositive in this case. 
I do find that I cannot reach the underlying issue given the time concerns in this case. I recognize that that seems very harsh to a lay person um, because these are very short turnarounds. I also recognize that in this case, the turnarounds were incredibly short, um, such that if this action were filed before the, um, <clears throat> even a day earlier, I would have considered it because that would have been five days following when the ball started rolling, so to speak, on the 27th. Um, the hypothetical I gave to Ms. Castillo is regarding whether or not this all happened in a single day, um, if this would be a bar to Mr. Einan receiving any relief, um, I would not have found that to be a bar because I believe that there needs to be sufficient time for the public and our citizenry to identify issues and seek judicial relief. That being said, there is a five-day clock that starts when the identification of the numbers of the advisory votes is given to the Attorney General's office. Um, even if the court simply looked at that five-day period and not when the short descriptions were filed, um, this action was initiated outside of that time frame. Those time frames are important in our system because of the quick turnarounds, given the timing of votes, the finalization of ballots and pamphlets, and the tremendous amount of work that our Secretary of State and other state agencies need to engage in to make these things all happen, um, particularly given the large population of voters that we have overseas at our military installations. The timing is very important. It can seem short, it can seem harsh, um, but again, it isn't even this court's capacity or role to determine whether or not they make sense because that is the law. And thus I find that there is a time bar to this action that prevents me from reaching the underlying issues this year in this case as to whether or not this should have been one or three advisory votes. This was and is an interesting case from a very human element, I would like to reach the underlying issue. Um, this very well could raise important issues in the future, but unfortunately, given the posture of this case, I cannot reach that underlying issue. Do the parties require any clarification regarding the court's ruling? Yeah. Again, thank you very much for everything in this case. I appreciate the quality of the advocacy. If there is a form of an order that either party has available, I will consider it. Um, and you may confer regarding that form if necessary. And I will remain on the bench until that happens.